I was talking to you recently and you said you don't really look at your movies and things and here we're forcing you to look this close to you. No, I, I, didn't look, I didn't look up at all. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, but, but hearing it, uh, you know, we, we shot this, uh, to, we didn't shoot it like a play, but, but I certainly had to learn the dialogue like a play. Uh, the schedule was only two weeks to make this film. Uh, I shot the first testimony in two parts uh, because of a blocking issue, and we shot the second testimony, entrance to exit, in one take. Wow. Um, that was like 28 minutes? 28 minutes, and it was seven, seven cameras, um, which I can go on about kind of the artistry uh, of, of William Friedkin. Um, you see what, what the camera sees, but what I'm looking at are seven cameras all in motion uh, at the same time. And it was like looking into the innards of a Swiss watch. Uh, and it was perfect, and it was like a ballet. And, and so easily can you be distracted, but not one grip accidentally bumped into a focus puller. Not one camera was ever blocked by another camera. Uh, it was seamless. And uh, the mind that can create that kind of camera block uh, is, is obviously one of the great directors of all time, and that was William Friedkin. Yeah, well, The French Connection, The Exorcist, Sorcerer, To Live and Die in L.A., on and on and on. And when you talk about all those cameras, he really is a, a, a master of knowing where to put the camera, when to put it. Uh, that really helps the actor's uh, performance. Well, it, it, it helps immensely. Uh, you know, and you might not always be aware of what he's doing. For instance, I was not as aware when we were making the film, as I was certainly when I saw it, that the first testimony, uh, the cameras and the lenses he chose were much closer. And the second testimony, the cameras were back a little farther. And all to create the illusion that I'm getting smaller in the chair. Uh, and so he's, he's incredibly helpful. Um, you know, I, I certainly worked on physicality to try and accomplish the same thing. Uh, but he was using his cameras uh, not just as a way to kind of show you an image, but he's actually contributing to the storytelling uh, by where he's putting the cameras and how he's using those lenses. And uh, so what happened? How did you get cast in this? Did, did he called you up and out of the blue and said, I want you to play a role that Humphrey Bogart made famous? No, he, <laughs> but it was kind of fantastic. It was very, very old school. There were no agents involved. There were no managers involved. And yes, he did just call me up. Um, and, and just to let you know why this story would kind of be kind of funny is William Friedkin was responsible for me. I was working as a theater actor. I was only 15, 16 years old in Toronto, Canada. Uh, my mother was a great theater actor. It's the community I grew up in, and I was very dedicated to that was the actor that I wanted to be. Um, and I went and saw The French Connection when I was 15. I didn't know anything about the film. Uh, and my response to it was so visceral, and the film was so uh, honest and aggressive. Um, and, and then obviously the performances of Roy Scheider and Gene Hackman uh, would have affected any young actor. Uh, and I left that theater that day knowing that I wanted to make films. I wanted to make films like that. Um, and it had a profound change in my life to live and die in L.A. You mentioned was, uh, another <coughs> film that was one of my favorites. Um, and, and so I respected this man incredibly. And so I get a phone call one day, and I don't recognize the number, but I answer it anyways. And it's uh -huh. guy on the other end says, hi, my name's William Freakin, and I would like to talk to you. About and I hung up. <laughs> and I thought, I thought it was one of my friends making a joke. And, and then about two minutes go by and I'm like, that doesn't sound like any of my friends. And then about two more minutes go by and I'm like, my friends aren't that smart. Like, oh shit. And I called the number back and he was laughing on the other end. He said, I, I didn't think you'd call back this fast. And, and then, uh, he was he was generous enough to, to ask me to do this film, and I was I was absolutely honored. Um, and it was very also very sweet. He went he went on to kind of give me a couple of explanations as to why he thought I should do it. And I'd already agreed to do it once I realized it was really him. So, yeah.
And it's so good, you know, uh, Bogart was great, such a memorable thing. This is completely different, Annabelle. This is a different take, and really you see a different side of Glee. I find him to be a sad character in this. You know, it's, it's almost sad to watch, watch what he does, and you do it so brilliantly here. But how did this project come about with Freakin? How did you decide to make this? Uh, it was Billy all along, and he just brought me along for the ride. I knew him, and he said he wanted to do this piece with Herman Woke, and then in the same breath, and Kiefer Sutherland is going to play Captain Quig. It was his first choice, always his only choice. And um, it, it came together fairly quickly, and we were really lucky that Billy was able to uh, get a great crew and an unbelievable cast, and he just knew he had the film in his head from the very beginning. But he really wanted there to be ambiguity around Queeg. He felt that in the earlier version, you knew exactly what was happening, and he knew that Kiefer had this long, slow fuse that could sort of unravel as things went on, and that was super important to him. He wanted the audience to be figuring it out as they went along. And we saw some of the actors in this, Matt. You put together a terrific, uh, cast ensemble overall. I, that was Jason Clark uh, interrogating you, and that was um, Jake Lacey, and on and on. Talk about how you brought them all together to do this in such a short amount of time. Too. Well, that's easy. It was all our casting director, our fabulous casting director, Denise Chamey, too. Like, I never worked with a casting director like her, and um, she was able to get anybody on the phone that we wanted and, and give us options, kind of as she pulled out of the woodwork, and uh, <laughs> It was really amazing to work with her and watch her work. Yeah. So what what was it like on the set in creating this character? What was your process in going through this and getting in his head and giving him such dimension that we hadn't seen before in any other version? And did you watch the original? Did you what kind of research might you have done into this? I was really familiar with the original, and I think it's one of one of Humphrey Bogart's greatest performances. It's it's quite down the line in his career, uh, and I think it's one of his most subtle performances. Um, and I love that movie. I love that film. Uh, obviously, conversations with Mr. Freakin were kind of the origin of where I would start uh, to kind of discover the character. For me, uh, and. I was just kind of aware of two things that happen when you get older, and, and it kind of really affected the way I would read the material. Uh, and, and these two kind of really not great moments in one's life kind of collide here in public in this trial. And the first one is that kind of terrible moment when you realize that you're not necessarily the man you want to be, and you have to reconcile with that and discover who you really are, the man you really are. And, and hopefully the separation between who you wanted to be all your life and who you really are is not that far. Unfortunately for Captain Commander Quig, uh, it's a very large divide that he has to reconcile in the context of this film. And the other is kind of realizing, uh, very sadly at some point, that you're less relevant than you once were. Uh, the Navy needed him 20 years ago. They don't need him very much now. And he's discovering these two moments uh, very difficult moments and reconciling with these two very diff difficult ideas in the middle of this trial. And you watch this man get broken. Uh, and, and that's very sad and painful to see. I, I have the same reaction to it. And regardless of, of, of some of his idiosyncrasies, and, and maybe he's not a very nice person, it's still very difficult to watch someone, a human being, uh, kind of be broken like this. Uh, and and he walks into the film uh, standing a certain way, and he leaves literally physically broken. And it was a very interesting kind of uh, kind of approach to the character. And what I really loved about Mr. Freakin's idea was that he evoked compassion for someone that you might not even necessarily like. And I think that that's such an amazing feeling uh, for us to all have as individuals and humans uh, to understand that we have that depth of compassion in us. And I think this film evokes that. And for this version, Annabelle, this has been updated, so it's not set in World War II now. Uh, what was the decision in moving it to Afghanistan, Iraq, that period? That felt like the most straightforward explanation. Um, and then Billy just slashed and burned. He cut out a lot of the openings, a lot of the swearing in. 
for the testimonial. He didn't want it to be too procedural, so he just literally cut huge swaths. But he stayed very, very loyal to the original work. That was really important to him to not stray too far. So he did sort of the bare minimum to keep as much of Herman Wilk's words on the page as possible. Uh, Matt, what, what kind of significance do you think this has for today's audiences when they're looking at this? Because it's been around, you know, for decades, but it takes on new significance. I think it's just as relevant as it ever was. Yeah, it's really exciting for us to tell this kind of like, you know, older story. This really kind of, uh, you know, simple yet complicated story um, about these people and these experiences they had. And um, I, I think it stands just as true today as it did then, you know, I think. Uh, yeah. It is, and um, you may have seen Kiefer in a courtroom before, a little movie called A Few Good Men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> courtroom dramas are interesting to do, and that one was unbelievable. You, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson, how would you compare the two experiences of, of doing that? Well, the experiences were vastly different, but I think the excitement of a courtroom drama is that the stakes are so high. You know, at, at at the root of every courtroom drama, someone's future is on the line. Um, and so that's that's exciting uh, stuff to watch and certainly very exciting to play. Uh, with regards to A Few Good Men, uh, I, I, it was the only day I've ever had off when I went into work anyway, it was the day that Jack Nicholson did the, you don't, you can't handle the truth speech. And, uh, and I looked around and, and so many other actors from other films had come on set for that day as well. Um, and Mr. Nicholson uh, just knocked it out of the park in one take. And I remember Rob Reiner kind of not knowing what to do. And he, he walked up to Jack Nicholson and said, do you mind doing that one more time? He said, well, we're here. And, uh, and Mr. Nicholson did it again. And, and Rob Reiner went, well, I guess we're wrapped. I don't know. And everyone went home early. So, so I guess I think, uh, you know, if you've got all your dialogue and everything ready and you've got your thoughts ready uh, and you have the opportunity to do those kinds of things in one pass, uh, that, that makes for a very exciting moment. And, uh, and so it inspired me, at least knowing that I was going to get this opportunity with Mr. Freak and just make sure you're prepared. That's it. Well, I guess we're wrapped. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming out and joining us here at Contenders.